Michael Brecker, when I first came to New York, was to play with Michael Brecker in Dreams. So what I was shocked about is that I lived with Mike Brecker for the first few months that I lived in New York because I, I, I didn't have a place, I hadn't made any income, so he let me stay at his loft on 19th Street. And uh, being an out-of-town guy, uh, for me, it was possible for me to find my way back home because all the buildings looked the same as far as I was concerned, you know, just one after the other. And I probably couldn't have found my way home if, if, if I hadn't been able to rely on the fact that Mike Brecker was practicing 24 hours a day. And all I had to do was listen my way home. That's how dedicated he was. Sonny Rollins, up until a few years ago when a respiratory infection stopped him from playing, practiced practically day and night. Even before a gig, he, get, he got to the gig three hours before the gig. He was practicing before the gig. Michael Brecker shared a similar work ethic. Where do you think that work ethic came from? And did it continue throughout his life? No, it definitely came from Train. He was noted for having a similar work ethic. And also from colleagues like Liebman uh, and those cats in that loft scene. Uh, Free, Light, Free Life Communication was the name of the actual group that organized based on that sort of free wheeling loft scene. They actually organized. Uh, Richie Byrack was a key fi figure on that scene, as was Bob Moses and Mike and Randy and uh, many others. Liebman said it, I don't have the quote in front of me, but I'll paraphrase it. You know, he kind of uh, put down this aesthetic that I believe a lot of musicians followed, including Mike. He said, you know, I didn't really have that much schooling, formal schooling. So I knew the only way to good to get good was to practice my ass off. And the only way to do that was to get a loft where I wasn't in a residential area where people would tell me to shut up. I could play 24 seven. He had uh, a, a method where he would throw down a key to people who showed up at three in the morning to jam. So, you know, and then he would let them up and they would play till five in the morning, then go down to Chinatown to get some breakfast and then go back and play some more. So they were constantly playing, constantly woodshedding. Mike was, I don't want to say obsessive, let's just call it super dedicated to woodshedding and perfection. He was really striving for perfection, and he knew that to attain what he wanted, the things that he is hearing in his head, he had to push himself and practice around the clock, and he did so when he got into, he ended up taking over uh, Lehman's loft and stayed there for about a year. And uh, in that space, he just, you know, people would come and visit him at all hours. And uh, he was also very meticulous about mouthpieces and reeds and was like a scientist investigating the possibility of things. So he was constantly searching uh, for a sound and searching to improve his sound and also the mechanics and the technique and the extended techniques on the instrument. Uh, he was uh, arriving at things through this relentless woodshedding, some of which were, interestingly enough, uh, guitar-oriented effects. He took a lot of influence from guitar players, including like the effect of the whammy bar bending a note, well, he began practicing note bending on the sax, which is not unheard of, but it's the way that he developed it into an art and really incorporated it into his music. He attributed to, uh, you know, guitar players like Albert King and even uh, Adam Rogers was telling me when they were on tour, you know, Mike would walk by when they were backstage warming up and he, Mike would stop and go, what was that? What are you doing there? And he would play the lick, and Mike would repeat it on sax. He's like, okay, I got it. <laughs> so he was constantly looking to add to his vocabulary. Uh, I mean, you could say that, you know, I sort of address this in the book, in the preface, about uh, this gift that he had. Was it genetic or was it environmental? Certainly, he, can, he has an incredibly talented brother. His sister, Emily, is a piano player. His father was a lawyer by trade, but was a singer-songwriter, uh, piano player, 
who uh, was the patriarch of their family jams in Cheltenham, Cheltenham uh, suburb of uh, suburban area uh, just north of Philly. He had a B3 in the house, a set of drums, a bass, and they would have regular family jams. So his father was talented, and as you go into the lineage, and his grandfather was a singer, and et cetera. So there is a genetic component, and I made this analogy. Maybe it's a faulty analogy, but because Mike was also six four and a half, he loved basketball and he was good at basketball. And there was a moment in time when Randy went off to Indiana University where Randy didn't know if Mike was going to go into music or basketball. He was playing clarinet. He was sort of half interested in it and was more interested in basketball. So I made this basketball analogy. Michael Jordan was, was genetically gifted, as was Michael Brecker. Michael Jordan was the last guy out in his high school teams, his college teams, and his pro teams. He was the first guy there, the last guy out. He would, he would shoot a 1,000 free throws every night. He would push himself beyond his own athletic nature. He would drive himself to perfect his game and expand on his vocabulary. Michael Brecker did the same thing. He was uh, pretty naturally gifted, and he pushed himself to this level of excellence that he strove for. And he achieved it through this relentless woodshedding.